Okay, we are now recording. This, my name is Ken Nilsestuen, and I have had the pleasure of serving as president of the France and Colonies Philatelic Society for quite some time now, about the time that Dave Herondine became editor of the journal, which is a long time ago. Um, we have, as a board, decided to start these Zoom meetings along with so many other philatelic groups, mm -hmm. and they've turned out to be pretty successful. This is number five, I think, at least number four. And tonight our speaker is Larry Rosenblum, who is going to talk to us about balloon mail and pigeon mail. So I think with, I wanna thank everybody for being here. I'll put in a brief commercial to say, if you are not already a member of France and Colonies, we welcome you. You can find us at franceandcolonies.org pay through PayPal, and we're always happy to have more members. So with that, Larry, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I will tell everybody I'm going to mute you now. And uh, Larry, you can unmute yourself. I think I'm going to do this. Okay, <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and start, I'll figure it out. Okay, well, all right, if you cut me off, let me know. <laughs> all right, well, let me restate Ken's welcome. Thank you to all of you who have joined today. Uh, I am gonna talk about what I call balloons and pigeons and some other topics um, related to the Parisians' use of airmail during the siege of Paris in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and 71. I will tell you that this presentation is going to be as much history as postal history, because it really involves an understanding of what was happening during the period and of the balloons uh, that were used in order to get a full appreciation of the postal history that covers. Larry, right, you'll see I, there I, are not. I figured it out. So please unmute yourself in just a moment. Okay, you hear me? Very good, thank you. All right, so as I was saying, it is necessary to understand the situation that the Parisians were in and why they resorted to balloon mail and what happened with particular balloons. If you can identify the balloon from the markings on the covers. So we'll tell, uh, or I will tell a lot of stories and history as well as showing some of the covers and talk about some other topics as well. Uh, some of you I will assume have seen the two articles that I did for Lynn Stamp News last year. I will have some of the same material from those articles, but also some different material as well. So there will be some new things. Um, I will talk about some references and things. And what we will do is send out an email after this presentation, not right after, but soon after, with a lot of links for uh, reference works, some of which I'll talk about, others that I will include. So uh, you won't have to feel like you have to uh, copy things down or cut and paste or whatever else. If you have specific questions about those, we'll deal with them later. Speaking of questions, uh, you're welcome to put questions in the chat box and we'll get to them. Um, I'm going to stop about two thirds of the way in to take a few questions at least, which also gives me a break. And um, then I will um, finish out the talk and I will be available for questions as long as members or attendees would like to uh, have a discussion. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So uh, on this title slide, I am showing um, a card which I would call a preview or a bit of a teaser. Um, the card was created in 1955 
to go along with the stamp that was issued at the same time. The card comes from the town of Soissons, which is a small town north of Paris. And one, at least one of the balloons, this particular balloon was spotted flying over the town on October 16th, 1870. And so the card commemorates that event. Uh, you can see on the balloon that it has a banner with the name of the balloon flying on it. That was a fairly common practice at the time. This one is the Jules Favre, and it was named after the person who is the vice president of the new government of France. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit in a few minutes. You can see the four passengers uh, in the balloon. And you can see some of the things that are attached outside of the basket or the gondola of the balloon. On the left-hand side, there are, is a smaller basket containing pigeons. That were some of the pigeons that were being brought out of Paris to be used in the pigeon mail. You see the anchor and the rope, which would be used to stabilize the balloon after it landed. And you see the, one of the post bags that was in the balloon. Uh, one of the passengers is um, holding out what appears to be a sheet of paper or a cloth and waving it in the air. This was done in order to determine whether the balloon was ascending or descending. If there was only a gentle ascent or descent, it might not have been obvious to the passengers, yet the pilot would want to, to know if there was any uh, vertical movement of the balloon. So that was a practice that um, existed at the time. I'll take a minute to talk about nomenclature. We refer to balloons for these vessels, but technically the balloon is literally only the balloon part. Uh, then there are the ropes and there is the gondola or the nacelle, whatever you wanna call it, that makes up the whole vessel. And the proper name for the vessel is an aerostat, and the passengers in the vessel are called aeronauts. Both of these are French words that came directly into English. However, it's so common to call these balloons rather than aerostats that I will continue to do that as well. Um, I think the term aeronaut is a little more common for the, um, the passengers in the balloon. The stamp was which is issued for stamp day in 1955, shows uh, a balloon being prepared for launch at Place Saint-Pierre in Paris, which is on the slope of Montmartre. Um, on the right-hand side are the postmen bringing in the bags of mail. On the left-hand side, there is a small balloon, I mean, small basket which would contain the pigeons as you see in the card as well. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about um, the balloon history. And the first manned flights of balloons took place in the 1780s under the auspices of the Montgolfier brothers. Uh, Joseph Montgolfier was um, a thinker and in, um, uh, an inventor and got to thinking about using hot air balloons to transport people. In fact, one of his thoughts was if he could build a big enough balloon and carrier, then they could use that to attack the English who were settled in Gibraltar at the time. Uh, this turned out not to be practical of course, but he continued to experiment and build balloons. And he involved his brother, Etienne, who was running the family's paper manufacturing factory and therefore can help him build the balloons. The first flight by a human being in a balloon not attached to the ground under the auspices of the Montgolfier brothers took place in November, 1783. The two aeronauts were Pilatra de Rosier, who was a science teacher and apparently something of a daredevil who was very interested in aeronautics and volunteered, worked with the Montgolfiers and volunteered to be a passenger. 
The other passenger was a fellow named Francois Laurent, who was a soldier in the French army in the Marquis d'Arland. And he was apparently a friend or at least an acquaintance of King Louis XIV. And when it came time to get permission to send people up in the balloon, Louis XIV was a little hesitant because of the risk involved. And the Marquis, at the urging of Pilatre, um, lobbied with the king and said he thought it would be safe and he volunteered to ride in the balloon, and which he did. So the balloon flight was successful. It was, as I said, a hot air balloon. So the balloon was filled with hot air before launching. And although you can't see it in this illustration, apparently it was covered up, but inside the balloon, there was a flame and there was a stash of fuel to keep the hot air going in the balloon. So they had a short and successful flight. There was another effort at ballooning and that was done by Professor Jacques Charles, who was a physicist. And he was experimenting with gases, including hydrogen. And he knew that um, hydrogen could be used to create a lighter than air balloon as well. So he was kind of under competition with the Montgolfier. And I, as from what I've read, it was kind of a friendly competition. Um, Professor Charles wanted to be the first, but he didn't quite make it. His balloon launched uh, a few weeks after the Montgolfiers. Uh, Professor Charles teamed up with the Robert brothers, uh, Jean and Louis, who were engineers, so they could help build the um, two uh, or build the balloon. And um, the first flight had Professor Charles and Louis Robert were the aeronauts. They did their flight from Paris as the Montgolfier brothers did and um, was a successful flight. They landed and uh, Louis Robert got out. This made the uh, weight much lighter and the balloon ascended again. And Professor Charles took that opportunity to do some more tests uh, and observations in the balloon and then um, descended and landed. So that was, uh, they were both successful flights. Um, you saw in, in, I think in the other card and in this one, there are a lot of people watching. This was a very fascinating um, event to the public. I mean, people flying through the air was a novelty as much as our first astronauts were in the 1950s and the 1960s. So there were a lot of people interested and, um, and watching these events. So after these initial balloon flights, uh, ballooning became um, something that was done a lot. Balloons were used for a number of things. They were used for research. They were used for military observation. They were used for entertainment as rides in uh, big fairs and things. Most of these balloons were used tethered to the earth to avoid the risk of the wind blowing the balloon someplace where it didn't want to go. But as a result of this, there were a number of balloons existing in and balloonists existing in Paris in 1870, which turned out to be fortunate. But before we get to Paris and their balloons, let's talk a little bit about the start of the war. Uh, in the 1860s, uh, France was an empire under Napoleon III, and Prussia was an ascending power, and there was a rivalry between the two countries. Prussia had joined with some of the German states to form the North German Confederation, and Prussia had also won a war against Austria in 1866. So it was clear their power was growing and there was a rivalry to France. And really both sides wanted to kind of duke it out, feeling that each side felt that they could beat the other or win, the, win a war against the other. In the case of France, this sadly turned out to be drastically overconfident, but nonetheless, that was the feeling. In Prussia, the military effort was led by Chancellor Bismarck, 
And he felt that he could win a war against France under one condition. And that condition was that France's allies, who were Russia in the east and Italy to the south, did not come to France's aid. Otherwise, Prussia would have been surrounded on three sides. So he managed to engineer a situation in which France declared war on Prussia. And he did that in the summer of 1870 by sending a very insulting telegram that um, insulted the emperor of France. And France responded, took the bait actually, and declared war on Prussia. As a result, um, France's allies felt there was not a need to come to France's aid because this was just another of Napoleon's expeditions perhaps. Whereas Prussia was already part of the North German Federation and had mutual defense treaties with the Southern German companies, countries, which they were not uh, merged with at the time. So all of the Germanic states were in the war on the side with Prussia. Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, this next slide, oops, sorry. This next slide has a map, uh, which I will use to describe the beginning of the war, which was fought um, on the Eastern side of France as the Prussian army came over the border. Um, Napoleon III sent out an army under control of Marshal, Marshal Bazaine. And um, to make a long story very short, um, Bazaine lost the battles against the Prussians and had to retreat his army to Metz, which is a city near the border, as you can see, and the city in the region of Lorraine. Um, and so he, um, he kept his army within Metz and the Prussians responded by placing a siege around Metz. So Napoleon III took another army and he was going to try to break the siege of Metz, but due to some miscommunication and uh, I don't know, other problems, he wound up with his army closer to the town of Sedan, which you see there. He was defeated by the Prussians. He was captured by the Prussians. And that was the end of the French empire. When the news got back to Paris in early September of 1870, the National Assembly set up its own government called the Government of National Defense. And this was the government that uh, was in charge during the war. Uh, on the map, you see Versailles, uh, southwest of France. This was ac actually occupied by the Prussians and used as the headquarters. So they marched through France around Paris and occupied Versailles. And by the middle of September, both Count Bismarck and King Wilhelm I were, had taken up residence in Versailles. Also on the map, you see the city of Tours. The, um, French government had set up a delegation in the city of Tours so it could operate away from where the Prussians would be. Uh, this was set up before the siege happened. And um, part of the difficulty of the war in France was the necess necessity of communicating between Paris and Tours. Uh, as the war progressed, this is getting a little bit ahead of the story, but by December, the Prussians were already in the vicinity of Tours and the delegation had to decamp to Bordeaux, which is further Southwest than Tours and is off of this map. So that was another situation that they had and um, made, made fighting the war more difficult. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to um, pigeon mail. <clears throat> so, Metz turned out to be the beginning and the, the first balloon mail of, uh, of the Franco-Prussian War. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The balloon mail started in early September when two pharmacists who were part of the army, 
were having a discussion. One pharmacist was Dr. Janelle. The other pharmacist's name I'll give you in a few minutes. This other pharmacist suggested to Janelle that you know they could build some small balloons and be able to transport messages out of METS, hopefully to be found by someone in uh, French controlled territory and delivered to the post office. Janelle took this idea and ran with it, as we say. He went to Marshall Bazin and got approval for it and some funding. And he and some others built many small balloons. These balloons cannot carry much weight. So what they determined was that the messages could be on small slips of paper that would have both the address and the message just on this piece of paper. So there's one shown here. And on uh, these pages, these pieces of paper could weigh no more than one tenth of a gram. So they had to be small and lightweight. Uh, in spite of the fact that this, the papers were so small, the balloons could only carry about a hundred of them. The earliest balloons carried fewer and some of the later balloons carried a bit more. Uh, Marshall Bazan said that it would not be appropriate to send official messages by this method because of the risk of them falling into Prussian hands, which was a realistic assessment, but that uh, army members could send personal messages this way. Uh, so the messages that would fly in each balloon were bundled up and the top of the bundle had a note which asked the finder to please bring this to the post office or to bring this to the mayor of the nearest town in return for a 100 franc award. Uh, the post office, when it got these, uh, in turn delivered them without requiring any postage payment. Some of them were postmarked, some of them were put in envelopes and delivered that way. Uh, but exactly how the post office came up with this process and exactly who paid the 100 franc reward, I've not found out, but I know that those things happened. So there were 14 of these balloons launched in the 10 days between September 5th and September 15th. And six of those 14 were retrieved by the French, so just under a half. The rest were either lost or captured by the Prussians and the messages presumably destroyed. Uh, although I think I read that some of these messages were just taken back and given out to people in the Germanic countries as sort of souvenirs of the war. Meanwhile, while uh, during those 10 days, uh, there was another set of balloons under the idea of a British war correspondent who was trapped in Metz by the name of George Robinson. And he, dis he urged Marshal Bazin to build bigger balloons and have the Army Engineering Department do that. And that's indeed what happened. And starting on September 16th, these larger balloons um, could uh, took mail and the pharmacist balloons were discontinued. So these balloons could carry somewhere between five and 32,000 messages. There were 11 such balloons of which five were successful. So again, a little bit less than half. But one of the unsuccessful ones the messages were taken to Crown Prince Frederick of Prussia. He, who is fluent in French, returned these messages to Marshal Bazin, but not before reading them and highlighting some of the messages in red. Among the messages he highlighted was a message from one of the other army officers complaining about Marshal Bazin and also a message from George Robinson talking about the poor conditions in Metz. Well, Bazin wasn't really too happy about this, so he put an end to the balloons on October 7th. I'm sorry, October 2nd. So, as I said, there were about 11 balloons. They carried um, about 150,000 messages in total. Uh, 
the pharmacist balloons had carried about 1,500 messages. Um, so uh, on October 17th, uh, Marshal Bazin wound up surrendering Metz, and uh, that was the, the end of the balloon mail. Um, I should mention here that Steve Walski, who is attending, has put had put together an excellent, uh, two excellent exhibits actually, one about the Mets mail, uh, and both of them he has kindly had posted on the web, and I'll be sending out some links to that. They're very worthwhile viewing, and Steve, I'll take the moment to thank you very much for making them available to everybody. So Matt's balloons ended in uh, October, um, but the siege of Paris had started on September 18th. And the Parisians kind of knew a siege was coming, but also were under the impression that it wouldn't last very long. They were hopeful that the French army would break this siege within a matter of weeks. Still, they made some provisions for getting mail and communications in and out of Paris. One of those provisions was laying a telegraph line down on the bed of the Seine, and they felt that the Prussians would not discover this, and they could continue to send telegraph messages. Unfortunately, that was not the case. The story is that um, a French citizen who, for some reason, was on the side of the Prussians actually told them about it. But regardless, the Prussians did find it about it about a week after the siege started and cut the telegraph wire. So that was the end of that plan. The post office also planned to have staff smuggle messages across the Prussian lines. Um, this turned out also to be unrealistic. They did this at the beginning of the siege. Some of the smugglers made it, others of the smugglers were captured, and I believe some of them were shot. And so the official practice of smuggling dis got discontinued very quickly. Uh, there were probably some private smugglers who operated during the war, but have nothing to do with the post office. But meanwhile, fortunately, the post office also began working on balloon mail. This stamp um, shown on the slide was issued this past November as part of the, or as a commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the balloon mail. And it shows the first balloon uh, that was launched in the siege, the balloon called Le Neptune. And it was owned by and flown by Jules Duroff, who was one of the balloonists in Paris at the time. On the left-hand side is an area of Paris, uh, probably Place Saint-Pierre, uh, from which the balloon would have launched. And on the right is the chateau in whose garden the balloon landed. And that chateau was owned by an admiral in the French Navy. So definitely friendly territory and a successful flight. Uh, excuse me here. There was a second flight on September 25th and um, that was also determined to be successful. So on September 26th, the post office announced the rules for balloon mail. There were to be two classes of mail. Regular letters uh, would be sent at whatever the regular postage rate was previous to the balloon mail. So for letters within France and the other territories which um, were, uh, had mail at the same rate of 20 centimes, that continued, that rate continued, and the mail, the rates for international mail continued as they were. And then there was a new class of mail, postcards, that were going to be charged 10 centime and would be flown by unmanned balloons. So the thought was that this was a less expensive way of allowing people to communicate. 
Unfortunately, the only trial that they did, or the first trial that they did of the unmanned balloon postcards was a failure. The balloon was captured by the Prussians. The post office decided to discontinue the practice of unmanned balloons. And postcards would still be sent, but at a low priority, uh, they could be sent by the regular balloon men. So several balloons were launched in early October, but these were balloons that were already in Paris. So they were relatively small. Many of them were not in good condition. One of those balloons um, became very famous. The balloon called the Armand Barbès, which was launched on October 7th. The reason that it became famous was for its passenger, the politician Leon Gambetta. He was the Minister of the Interior in the new government and was a very popular politician. And he determined that the war could not be run successfully from Paris. He needed to go to tour and he was going to take over the position of the Minister of War, I believe it was, and, and take charge of the war. Um, you can see as he took off, uh, because the Parisians were encouraged and hopeful that under his leadership, the siege would be broken. Uh, so there was a big crowd to see him depart. Um, there was a second balloon that was launched at the same time. You see that over on the right there. He made it successfully to tour, but unfortunately, the breaking of the siege did not happen. Uh, you see on the bottom of the card, a stamp honoring Gambetta that was issued in 1938, the 100th anniversary of his birth. And this card was created and canceled in 1946 when the Parisians celebrated the 76th anniversary of the balloon mail. They were, I assume, unable to celebrate the 75th anniversary of balloon mail because they were a little busy with other things to do in the fall of 1945. On the left-hand side of the card, you see a cachet that was applied to some of the letters that were carried personally by the aeronauts. This was done by some of the aeronauts, probably mostly for friends and family and maybe famous people and such. It was a risky undertaking because if they happened to land in Prussian territory and the Prussians found them carrying mail, then they would be considered a spy, which was uh, a more serious offense to the Prussians than just being the passenger on the balloon. Nonetheless, these letters exist and the few letters that exist are well prized by collectors. <clears throat> so, the first piece of postal stationery that I have to show is one from early October. It was postmarked in Paris on October 1st, uh, and it has a receiving postmark on the back from the city of Tours on October 15th, which I inset here in the image. Uh, on October 12th, two large balloons were launched. These were the first balloons that were custom built the French post office had contracted with two different companies that were formed to manufacture balloons. And they set out manufacturing larger balloons and a large number of balloons that could be used to carry the mail. So these two balloons were launched on October 12th. The cover here exemplifies the situation at that time. This cover was mailed uh, was postmarked on October 1st and is indicative of the fact that the post office in Paris was backlogged by all the mail that had accumulated since the beginning of the siege. The first balloons until these two um, either carried no mail or very little mail. So there was a big backlog of letters. With these balloons, the Paris post office began clearing the backlog. Because of this, and because there were two balloons that had very similar flights, it's not 
100% certain which balloon this letter flew on. The judgment of the postal historians who studied this was that most of the mail from late September and the first few days of October flew on these two balloons. So the assumption is that this letter was carried on one of those two balloons, landed outside of Paris and was delivered to the post office on October 12th and made its way to tour, but was delayed either on the way or in tour and didn't get a postmark until October, a receiving mark until October 15th. But there is another possibility that I can't rule out. There were two other balloons that flew on October 14th. And it is conceivable that this letter somehow got delayed until those balloons landed on October 14th, got quickly to tour, and was postmarked on October 15th. So this is why, uh, or an example of these early letters, which we know probably which balloons were eligible, but uncertain as to exactly which balloon it flew on. The Louis Blanc has an interesting story with it in which to tell it. The pilot of the Louis Blanc was a person named uh, Eugène Farco, who was a watchmaker living in Paris and someone who was interested in aeronautics and actually had spent a lot of time seeing if he could devise a method which which these balloons could be steered. This was uh, a severe problem, of course, of these balloons, because as it was, they were subject to the winds. The only thing a pilot could do was raise or lower the balloon to perhaps get winds going in a different direction uh, as necessary but there was no steering of the balloon. And a number of people, including Farco, had spent some efforts in trying to figure out how to do that. It turned out, of course, not to be practical until many years following when we could have uh, a different power source for an engine that would be able to power the balloon and manipulate it. Nonetheless, Farco volunteered to be the pilot on the flight, even though he had never flown a balloon previously. It turned out to be a very difficult flight. Uh, in um, landing, well, first of all, as he approached land, he discovered that he had passed over into Belgium. So this turns out to have been the first international airmail flight. He knew he was in Belgium, which was considered friendly territory. Um, he attempted to land and actually crashed into the ground. The basket tipped over and the upper part of Farco's body actually fell out of the, or slipped out of the basket and landed on the ground and injured his face. But before anything else could happen, the balloon lifted off again and he was picked up and brought back up into the air. He went, there was one passenger in the balloon who didn't fall out of the basket, but was also kind of bruised up by this. But this was only the beginning of their adventure. They wound up being dragged through the forest, bumping into branches and trees and so on and so forth. And Farco was convinced they were going to die and felt very guilty about having a passenger on it. And he was not able to uh, prevent this. Fortunately, as it turned out, the balloon hit a big tree. And although Farco originally thought they would be doomed, instead the tree managed to stop the, ba the balloon and the balloon collapsed. And the two of them were able to get out of the basket. Farco was so relieved at this that he just started laughing hysterically. His passenger was a little disoriented and not so amused, but Farco was. After he, after he landed, they were approached by residents of the area who weren't quite sure what to make of this. The Belgians probably knew even less about the balloon mail than the French people outside of Paris. But eventually they discovered that you know, this was not an, a dangerous situation. And Farco just 
kept laughing and dealing with the people. And at one point he ran up to a woman he, before she could stop him, he gave him a big kiss. And he said, this kiss comes to you from France. Eventually the situation calmed down and he and the passenger made their way back to France. But it was an exciting and nearly very dangerous adventure. Now, how do we know all this? Well, Farco wrote a book about his experience, which was published four years later in 1874. It was a very popular book and went through six editions in just the first year. This is again indicative how, of how interested people were in balloon flights and airmail. Meanwhile, most of the other flights had reports written about them by one or another of the passengers. Uh, many of the flights were piloted by members of the military, and uh, they were, I think, required to write a report. Others wrote reports on the request of, say, a newspaper, which wanted to print a story. So we have a lot of reports of what happened on many of these balloons. Now, that was a very difficult flight. Um, the next cover I have is dated November 6th in Paris and has an arrival stamp on November 9th in the port city of Le Havre. And it flew on November 8th on a balloon called the Gironde. This turned out to be a very successful and easy flight. And it was written up by one of the pilots who recounted that the four passengers of this flight, they were at a high altitude, well above um, interference by Prussian bullets or anything. And it wasn't extremely windy. So they all kind of settled down and um, laid out some newspapers and had themselves a wonderful lunch and tossed all the waste overboard. And along with this lunch was a bottle of wine that they enjoyed. And the flight turned out to land successfully and was essentially uneventful. And apparently this idea of including bottles of wine along with lunch was a common practice. It was an essential part of lunch in France those days. The Gironde was a very easy flight. That was not the case with this one. The telltale sign of this cover is the fact that it is postmarked in Paris on November 21st, but it was received in the town of chalon sur saone which is about 200 miles south of Paris, on December 12th, 21 days later. Now, exactly what happened to this flight? Well, my slide kind of gives it away. It went via Norway. The story of this flight is in mid-November, the Parisians started launching the balloons at night because the, Paris, the Prussians had the nasty habit of firing bullets up in the air at these balloons as they left Paris. And the French thought it would be better to launch at night when the balloons would not be visible. Uh, this one launched not only at night, but in very foggy conditions. So the aeronauts could not really see what was happening. By morning, as the light began, they heard a lot of noise underneath and they thought it was the sound of trains running. When they broke through the fog, they found out it wasn't trains, it was the ocean or water. They were over the North Sea. They uh, continued to fly until they spotted a ship and they thought that if they were able to lower the balloon near the ship, someone or some people on the ship could grab the rope and kind of then haul them in to the shore. Uh, this didn't quite happen. As shown in the right-hand picture here, um, they overflew the boat and nearly crashed uh, into the water. The balloon was descending rapidly. They had run out of the ballast, so they wound up wound up throwing over one of the mailbags. This in turn caused the balloon to shoot up 
And pretty soon they were miles high in the sky and continuing to fly to the Northeast. After a couple more hours of flight, they had lowered the balloon and they saw that they had, were passing over a forest uh, with the ground covered with snow. So they decided to bring the balloon down. As they were landing, the passenger got caught up in the rope in the balloon. The pilot had hopped out of the balloon, then came back, went back into the balloon to help free the passenger. While that happened, the balloon had taken off again. He pilot freed the passenger and the two of them jumped out of the balloon. It was already pretty far up in the air, but fortunately, because it was snow on the ground, they were uninjured. And here in this other person, uh, this other picture, you see them uh, waving futilely at the balloon. This balloon took off without them. There they were trapped in the snowy mountain. They did not know they were in Norway. Uh, they started walking down the mountain. They managed to avoid being attacked by a number of wolves that came across them, but decided probably they didn't look very appetizing. Uh, so they found eventually an abandoned hut. They were able to spend the night in the hut, which was certainly warmer than being outside. The next morning, they continued down the mountain and found another hut that looked like it was more occupied. So they waited there. Eventually, the family that owned it came there and communicating with objects and probably sign language and whatever else, because they didn't speak a common language. The aeronauts found out they were in Norway. And the family figured out that the best thing to do was to get these people to the capital of Norway, which at that time was called Christiania, although um, today it's known as Oslo. So they managed to transport the two aeronauts to the nearest train station uh, using a variety of uh, transport methods. And um, the two aeronauts made their way to Christiania. News, of course, travels very quickly. So the, these people were hailed as heroes as they were making their way. So they got to Christiania. Now, how about the mail? Well, that bag of mail that they tossed overboard was rescued by a ship. It was brought ashore in to a town of Norway and given to the post office, I believe. Anyway, it made its way to Christiania and was given to the aeronauts. The same thing with the other mailbags, which had remained in the balloon after it took off by itself. It had flown another 50 miles or so. It landed on a farm. The mailbags there were rescued and made their way to Christiania as well. So the aeronauts now had all the mail that they had carried on the balloon. Now the question was how to get to France. It was determined that the best way at that particular time was to take a ship to London, go overland to Southampton, then take another ship to the French port of St. Malo, which is what they did. And then from St. Malo, they took their train to tour where they put the letters into the mail. This letter that was shown on the previous slide um, obviously took more train rides and wound up in the destination town where it was postmarked on December 12th. So I thought a little bit about this story, which is well reported, um, and think about how this letter traveled. It traveled by man balloon, by unmanned balloon. Once it landed, it traveled probably by foot, boat, sled and then train to get to Christiana. It joined with the aeronauts. It went by ship, by train in England, by another ship, and then more trains in France, all to get to its destination. Other than 
the other male that flew on this same balloon. I doubt that you will find another cover that went with this wide variety of methods of transport. In addition, I did a rough calculation and determined that this letter traveled about 2,200 miles in order to get a net distance of 200 miles. So a ratio of about 10 to one. Again, uh, you probably won't find any other items of postal history other than this letter's uh, fellow travelers, which had that ratio of miles traveled to the actual miles it needed to go. So what I said in the beginning, that understanding the significance of this letter requires understanding what happened to it, and then it becomes a really fascinating story. This letter also has a story to tell. The indication is the fact that it has a postmark in Paris of December 11th, but it has no receiving postmark. This letter flew on the Ville de Paris, which was landed in um, Prussian territory. The balloon, the, I said that, the Ville de Paris departed on December 15th. It was captured by the Prussians. There were uh, at least two passengers on this flight. The passengers were um, held by the Prussians, as was the mail. The uh, pilot of the flight was taken by the Prussians eventually to Versailles to be questioned by the Prussians there. But as he was being led around Versailles, he managed to escape his Prussian captors, managed to avoid being shot by the Prussians, and successfully crossed into French territory. So he was only held by a total of about a month. The, one of the passengers was held for three months before he was released by the Prussians. The mail was held by the Prussians until late July, 1871. And that's when it was delivered. Um, the post office in France decided not to put receiving marks on these letters. So we don't know exactly when it was delivered. <clears throat> the last balloon letter I'm going to show is this newsletter or uh, air letter containing news. So these were uh, an innovation in Paris. This particular uh, version or uh, journal started on October 22nd. It was the first of its kind. There were soon many more because it just took a printing press to do it. So this um, journal, which is called the Lettre Journal de Paris, and its subtitle is Gazette des Absents or Gazette for persons who are absent from or are not in Paris, uh, had two sides of this paper, two half sides, were contained news of the war effort and what was going on in Paris and all sorts of other things. And then there was space for the sender to write a personal message. As you see here, the sender used up every bit of available space, including the margins around the newsletter. This particular edition is dated December 24th. It was purchased that morning, presumably, by the recipient who wrote the letter, dropped it in the mailbox, and it was postmarked in Paris uh, in the early evening of December 24th. And it flew on the Tourville uh, on December 22nd. There is an arrival mark in the back, which looks like January 1st. Um, it's a little hard to tell the date, but it's clearly January. So it spent several days after the balloon flight making its way, which considering that it was the holiday period and a difficult winter um, is not to be unexpected. So this is the end of my section on balloon mail. And what I'd like to do now is stop for just five or 10 minutes and take a few questions, which also allow me to stop talking for a minute and have a drink of water. So um, Ken, if, have there, if there are any questions in chat, 
or else um, some of the attendees can unmute themselves if you have any questions that maybe I can answer. So we do have a few uh, in the chat boxes here. One of them was, how many balloon covers were forged? If so, what should one look for in collecting them? <laughs> Very interesting story. Um, I actually have a forged cover, which, uh, or a forged item, which I will show in the second part of the presentation. So I'll talk a little bit more about it. But as to what to look for, I think Steve Walski, if he is willing, is a much better person to discuss that. I mean, there are some things that can be obvious. Um, there are some things on my cover that I show, which Steve was kind enough to tell me about. So if you study it um, and you study this balloon mail, you can tell. But if you're just a casual collector who comes across an envelope or a cover that looks like one of these and it says Parmelo Monte and it looks like a Paris postmark, many of these forgeries are, are good enough that it will fool the casual observer. So I can say that. And so you have to either be knowledgeable about it or if you're going to buy one from a dealer, get the um, agreement that you'd be able to return it for a refund if it turns out to be a forgery. I have uh, Tom Broadhead with his hand up. Tom, do you want to unmute? And... Yeah, hey, great, Larry. I always enjoy that. I always enjoy chatting with you about these things. The yes, Tom. Things that I, I had found because I collected an exhibit uh, postcards from the from the siege, and the fact that the international rates for postcards were the same as for the folded letters, it, it is kind of beyond me why somebody would uh, uh, have an open message with less real estate to to write their message for for the same postage cost. That seems like an imponderable to me. <laughs> right. yeah, maybe it was just the convenience of having access to it or, you know, just scribble maybe. on the card, frank it. And I, yeah, it doesn't seem comprehensible, but who knows? And, and I think an, another observation is that the use of postcards uh, declined considerably, uh, you know, totally. Uh, beginning in uh, December, uh, you get you have the big flood of the, the backlog uh, from uh, September and early October. And then after that, I think, you know, people, you know, lost interest or didn't consider it to be worth the, uh, uh, the convenience or the low price. Well, I think if I remember correctly, and we may have discussed it, the postcards were sent at lower priority because they were lower postage. Once dedicated balloons, the idea of dedicated unmanned balloon was thrown out, then in addition to the vagaries of regular balloon mail, if you mailed a postcard, you knew it would be the last one to get on a balloon. <laughs> right. Right. Yep. So um, other than someone who, for whom the difference between 10 on ten on teams and 20 on teams made a big difference, you would send a letter for the higher priority. Yeah. Well, and, and also the um, uh, foreign destination postcards, even in the early mails, generally appear to have been treated more like letters because they were paying the full, the full rate, you know, 30 centimes or higher. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Larry, a couple more questions relating to the Norway balloon. First of all, one of them asked about what happened to the balloon. And the second question is, did any of the mail that came back from Norway actually get a transit marking? Okay, the balloon was given to the University of Norway. Uh, I don't know if it was a particular branch or whatever. Um, and it may still be there. I, I do not know, but I know the balloon made it in Norway. Um, I'm sorry, and the second part was, uh, did it, were there any transit markings on the mail that came back that made it through? Not that I'm aware of, 
Um, I think they were sealed in the bags until they released France, till they reached France. That makes sense, right? Why would um, either Norway or England open the mail bags? Um, although there might have been mail addressed to England, there was a lot of cross-channel mail. Um, so I, I don't remember. Um, it's, it's something worth research. I mean, it might have been, uh, it seems like the post office in France was pretty organized in terms of the mail. For example, uh, even though one bag was thrown overboard, it's known which postmark dates were in that bag as opposed to postmark dates in the other bags. And so the mail must have been organized. It's possible that international mail was also separate. And it's possible then that that mail might have been uh, retrieved in England and taken to the British post office rather than traveling to France and then having to come back to Britain. But I don't know that for a fact offhand. It might be documented. Um, Ernest Cohn, Ernst Cohn wrote a whole book on the subject. I was gonna mention it later, but I'll mention it now. He wrote a whole book about the Ville d'Orléans and the flight, which is where I got the little bit of information I shared about the uh, experiences there. And um, he probably has information in that book about how the mail was treated. That book was published by the Collectors Club of Chicago and is still available from them in PDF format from their website. That will be one of the links that we will send out after um, this presentation. But um, you can also go to Collectors, search for the link to Collectors Club of Chicago and then search for their publications and purchase the book, which is what I did. Thank you. And the last, uh, question that's, I take that back. There's two questions still. One of them is about how many balloon covers survive. I don't know. There's, it's a lot. Say this later. There's the theory that about two and a half million covers were sent. Uh, I don't know how many really survived, but the snarky answer is there are three million of those in people's collections because of the number of forgeries. <laughs> but in actuality, I, I don't know if there's an estimate of how many survive. And the, the last question before we turn you loose on the second part is, were any of the letters addressed to the United States? I believe so. Um, I don't recall seeing any, I didn't particularly look at them, uh, but I would think there would be some address to the United States. I mean, just because there would be families that span uh, France and England or business mail between the US. It, I would say it's probably not common. The foreign letters that I've noticed and I haven't really looked particularly at them, mostly go to England. Um, you know, a few go to Prussia or Switzerland, probably Spain and Italy, but I would think there would be some to the United States. And don't forget Algeria. There were some that went there. Okay. Well, as you have reminded me, that's considered part of France. It is. Um, I, I have a cover that came to the U.S. I have a balloon monte. Well, there, was, there was one in that presentation that I made a month ago in Lancaster. Yeah, I have a postcard that went to the U.S. Uh, via London. Very yeah, good. mine went via, via London also. Thank you. All right, let's uh, let Larry start on part two and all the rest of us go back to mute it again. All right. Thank you again. All right. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> all right. Now we'll talk about pigeon mail. So we've talked about balloon mail, which was getting letters out of Paris into the rest of the world. How about getting letters or messages back into Paris? This was much more difficult. 
there was some thought at the beginning of possibly having balloons that might be lucky enough to get the winds just right and land in Paris. And to my knowledge, that was never even really tried. Uh, the risk would be too great. You get a little off cost, a little off course, and you're right in Prussian territory. And then you would either have to fly a longer distance or land and suffer the consequences. But what was used fairly early on, um, although it took a long time to actually develop, was pigeon mail. Pigeons had been used for sending messages since um, the Roman period, so it was nothing new. There were a lot of pigeon fanciers and pigeon racers. In fact, the, there was a big collection of them in Belgium and in Northern France. When the war started, uh, some of the pigeon masters, I will call them, went to Napoleon III's government and, and offered to help with pigeons and as for communication. But Napoleon refused, or someone in his government did. After the empire collapsed and the new government was set up, excuse me, after a little bit of convincing, they agreed to use balloons. And in fact, some pigeons, I'm pigeons, not balloons, my apologies. Some pigeons were sent to that delegation location in Tours before the siege took place. So there were already some pigeons staged. And after the first couple of balloons, every balloon contained a number of pigeons that were designed uh, to go out of Paris and take pigeon mail back in. So how did this operate? The earliest pigeons were just a single message written on a piece of paper, presumably in a, uh, an official message from the government in tour to the government in Paris. And it was tied to the tail of the pigeon as a piece of paper. This turned out to be a bit of a problem because the paper wasn't really very durable. So very quickly, they determined to put the paper in a little tube, such as the one you see on the slide here. The tube was either made of a feather from a large bird or a manufactured tube of lightweight metal. But still, initially, there was only one message per tube and one tube per bird. Then there was a chemist in the city of Tours who came up with the suggestion of taking these messages writing them in big letters on cards, posting the cards in a rectangle on the wall and photographing them. And this, what would be a micro photograph could then be sent in the pigeons or with the pigeons. And when it got to be, it got in Paris, it could be read with the use of a magnifier or a microscope. So, this practice happened for a while. Then someone came up with the idea of, what if we print these letters and then photograph the printed matter, which could have a higher information density. The printed letters, a lettering could be smaller and clearer than handwritten letter. So in fact, that was then done. And by early November, this was enough established practice that the pigeon post was open to the public. Uh, the rule or the cost of this was 50 centimes per word. So this was a very expensive message, way of messaging at first. Remember, as we just discussed, a normal letter cost 20 centimes for the whole letter. And this was 50 centimes for a word. However, over time, that price got reduced in several steps in Towards the end of the war, the price was only five cents per word, which was, um, of course, much cheaper. <clears throat> On my next slide here, I've got an example of the uh, printed messages. Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> here we have a number of messages that were printed before being photographed. For example, this one here from Nice on the 2nd of December, 
to this person at this address. It says everything nice, children in good health, receiving your letters, going well, kisses, signed Zoe. So um, messages were going out through the pigeons in this methodology. Over on the right was another idea that was established. These, uh, the card there is called a dispatch reply card. And I'll talk about the format of the card in a minute. But uh, the card was sold in Paris at the post office for five centimes, which was the value of the stamp attached to it. The person who bought it included it with the balloon letter. And in the balloon letter, would ask four different questions that could be answered either yes or no. That person also only wrote on the card in this first column with a sequence number. The thought being that a correspondent might send several different cards in sequence, but they might arrive at the addressee out of order because of the vagaries of the balloon mail. So the first one could be numbered one, two, three. The respondent would indicate, um, or just the presence of this card when it sent back had its number in. So the recipient outside of Paris would fill in this card. And the different columns were number one, the location, which the person was in. Number two, the initials uh, or name of the person writing it. Number three, the name of the addressee and the address of the addressee in Paris. And then four slots for yes, no, yes, no, whatever those uh, answers were to the questions. This card was then put in the mail, franked with one franc of postage, which paid the cost for this card, and eventually made its way to tour or later to Bordeaux once the delegation had to move to Bordeaux. So here we have these, uh, an example of the transcription of one of these cards. Um, the first one comes from the town of Arcachon. This came into Bordeaux, it was in December um, after the delegation had moved to Bordeaux. Arcachon, uh, the initials, the name and address, and then O, O, N, O, we, oui, we, oui, non, we, oui, the answer to the four questions. <clears throat> when this was received in Paris, it was um, transcribed onto a blank card or onto another piece of paper and then mailed within Paris back to the original correspondent. So this was happening roughly in November, which was the third month of the siege, which was the first time that um, a reasonable number of messages actually got into Paris. But there were more improvements to come, thanks to the person here shown on the left, René Dagon, who is a photographer and an inventor in Paris. And he had already been using microfilm as a way of reducing messages and using it for various purchases. He did not invent microfilm that was invented in England some years earlier, but he perfected the process. After the siege began and pigeon mail began, he proposed to the post office that his microfilm method might allow them to have even more dense method of, uh, of sending messages back into Paris by pigeon. The post office agreed to that, came to an agreement with Dagron. They agreed that he and one of his assistants would fly out of Paris along with equipment that would be split among two balloons. And it wound up that, that those balloons would be launched on November 12th. The balloons were called the Daguerre and the Nieps. So um, Dagron and his assistant flew on the Nieps along with some of those, um, some of his equipment. Uh, 
The rest of the equipment's on the Daguerre, along with a few other aeronauts, including a pigeon master, uh, many of whom were going out to tour or Bordeaux to help with the pigeon mail. Well, this was still when the balloons were being uh, launched during the day, and the Daguerre was hit by Prussian rifle fire and eventually landed in Prussian territory. The equipment, of course, was seized, and the aeronauts, including the pigeon master, were held in prison by the Prussians until after the war. So this was kind of the risk, of course, that all the aeronauts went in, and yet so many of them volunteered, as the pigeon masters do, to help the war effort. A great amount of bravery and potential self-sacrifice during the war. De Grun and his uh, assistant on the Nieps, that balloon also landed in Prussian territory, but he and his assistant, assistant were able to escape the Prussians. They split up. De Grun spent several days in Prussian territory trying to make his way through. During the day, he had to kind of masquerade as a local and fit in so that the Prussians wouldn't understand that he was someone who had come from Paris. And at night, a friendly French person or family would transport him by cart to another location. So after three or four days, he finally made it into French-held territory. But he got to the French, and they didn't quite believe his story of balloons and pigeons and microfilm. So they had to send a message to Tour to validate who de Grun was before they would release him, which they ultimately did. So in the end, it took de Grun nine days to get from Paris to Tour. And his equipment was lost or destroyed in the process. His assistant fared a little bit better and made it there in six days. Nonetheless, even after all of that, de Grun went to work, recreated or rebuilt whatever equipment, and started to use microfilm. Microfilm has the advantage over a photograph of it can be projected, and that's exactly what they did in Paris, as you see here. So they use this projector to project the messages onto the wall, and then people sat in front of it, as you see here, transcribing, and then the transcriptions could be sent out wherever they were going. So the details of the microfilm was each sheet of microfilm was one and a half by three inches big and contained an average of 3,000 messages. Obviously, these, for the most part, were short messages, as you saw on the previous slide, but still 3,000. Each microphone was put into one of these containers, either a bird feather or a metal container. And by that time, the pigeon could carry 12 to 18 of those because the total weight of all of those was less than one gram. So it was barely any weight for the pigeon. So that was the good news. The bad news was here we were in uh, late November, December, and January. It was a bad winter, and pigeons had a number of obstacles to getting back to Paris. One was they could be shot by the Prussians. Another was they could be shot by a hungry Frenchman who thought, ah, here's a bird in the sky. It's lunch. Um, there were natural predators, such as hawks, and the Prussians, of course, were very glad to bring in more predators to try to capture the pigeon. The pigeons could have gotten lost in the winter, could have starved for lack of food or lack of water. The end result was only about 20% of the pigeons that were released made it into Paris. And the percentage started higher than that, but decreased over time as the winter got worse. The way that the post office got around that was to send each of these group of messages multiple times. 
each microfilm was labeled with some sort of identifier. And they would keep sending another copy of that microfilm to Paris until Paris acknowledged receipt by sending a balloon mail letter that got to tour saying we received such and such and such uh, messages by pigeon. So some of these microfilms were sent as many as 22 times for those containing personal mail and as many as 34 times for official messages, which were deemed more important and perhaps got sent more frequently. So in spite of all these obstacles, by the end of the war, several hundred thousand unique messages had been sent by Pigeon. And since this was the end of a siege, which was more difficult because it was a lot longer than anyone expected, and because the winter was especially harsh, this was very good for the Parisians to be able to get some messages from presumably their family who was outside of Paris. So the efforts of the pigeon masters, the people in Tours, de Grone and his associate from Paris, all these people worked very hard to get this method of communication to work. We'll talk a little bit about another story about an individual communication. And I will confess that when I first read this story, I didn't quite believe it, but I found out that it was true. There's a fellow pictured here, I assume it's an appropriate likeness, of Alfred Roseler. He was a manufacturing chemist who worked in Paris. As the war began or before the war began, he sent his wife to live outside of Paris for her safety. He presumably remained in order to stay on the job. He wanted to write his wife a letter almost every day after the siege was placed, but he didn't quite trust that newfangled balloon mail of the post office. So he determined that he was gonna write two copies of every letter. One copy he would frank and drop in the mailbox to be sent by the balloon mail. The other letter he would frank and he put a note on the top saying, uh, addressed to whoever found it saying, please drop this letter in the post. He attached this letter to a little toy balloon as pictured there and let it go. So he figured he had uh, a backup plan or you know an alternate methodology. And from what I've read, uh, about 21 of his 100 letters was successfully found and put in the post office. So no doubt there were some letters that uh, the balloon mail didn't reach his wife for some reason or another. So he improved his chances of communication. Uh, these letters were saved by the family and eventually have made it out into the uh, collecting market. These balloon, le these letters are known as Gravillier. The reason for that is his house in Paris was on Rue des Gravilliers, and somehow the letters got named after the street. Why the letters are not named Les Roseleurs, I have no idea, but we have what we have. So if you see a reference to Gravillier letters, that those are the ones by balloon. Another story is a method that was devised for getting letters into Paris, and that was Les Boules du Moulin. It was an idea first um, presented by the, an ex-mayor of the French city of Lyon. And he suggested that they could make zinc cylinders, which is called boule in French, and put paddles around the edge, drop these things up river in the Seine and have them float into the city. Now, and the letters would contain, uh, the bull would contain letters and would then be sealed watertight. And the post office agreed to this and agreed that the service for this would be 
headquartered in the city of Moulin, which was um, southeast of Paris, I believe, uh, considerably further from Paris. The place where the letters would be uh, put into the Seine would be in a town called Bray sur Seine, which is shown on this postage stamp, which commemorates this method of sending messages. So the sender would send a letter, which would cost one franc for the service. Uh, we get to Moulin, it would be packaged in a bowl and sealed up then given to people who would take it across Prussian lines and somehow get to brace their sin and dump it in the river. Interesting idea put into practice in early January of 1871 and none of the bulls that was released got to Paris or at least was found during the siege. So in terms of getting messages into Paris, during the siege, it was a total failure. But it was an interesting idea that obviously lives on. Some of these bulls were found in 1871, as I'll describe in a minute. Some of them lay in the riverbed for a long time. The most recent one was found in the 1960s, almost 100 years after it was let go. Uh, about half the letters that reached Moulin got actually put in a bowl. Probably more fortunately for the other half, they were not, and they were released into the mail after the end of the siege at the end of January. So those letters got delivered with some delay. The letters in the bowl, well, some were 100 years in the sin, and I believe there are still some bull unaccounted for that are probably now buried deep in the river. So what I've pictured here on the left is a cover from an auction catalog from a couple of years ago, which was dedicated to all sorts of mail from the war period. So the one at the upper left-hand corner that's franked with four stamps totaling one franc of postage, that was a Boule de Moulin letter. It was discovered in Paris in August of 1871, so about six or seven, seven months after the uh, siege was over. And actually after the war itself was over, the treaty had been signed by then. It was addressed to a general in the army. By the time this letter was found, the general had been assigned to go to St. Petersburg. And this letter was forwarded to St. Petersburg. You can probably see that the address is crossed out, although you can't read the writing on it. So the fact that this letter traveled in the Boule de Milan and then got forwarded to St. Petersburg makes it an interesting one for the cover. Below that is one of the Gravillier letters. You can see the name Roseleur on it. You can also see the town of Aubusson, which is where Roseler's wife was. So those are also of interest to collectors, of course. And the final letter that's shown there with the red stamp of 80 centimes, which is a letter that went to Calcutta, India, one of only three letters to that destination known, and of course, therefore, interested to, of interest to collectors. So that's why the auction house put those three on the cover. Uh, this auction and several others, the PDF version of the catalogs are still available and I'll send you those links. So you can look through all sorts of uh, letters uh, and other artifacts from the war in those catalogs. Okay, now I have a personal story and it relates to that question about forgeries. And um, as you'll see when I get in the story, it was Steve Walski who helped me with this. So again, thank you, Steve. So I bought this from a dealer that I know and I trust as an honest dealer, but he is not an expert in French postal history, not to mention in balloon mail. 
So being of customer service, he knew I was interested in balloon mail and finding some items for my writing. And most of the covers that you saw earlier, I got from him. So from somewhere, I don't know, he got this item. So it purports to be an official government form, uh, has Balloon Monte written on it, Minister of Finances written on it, a emblem in the middle with the French flags. The idea was that this was an official form that was designed to be free franked by government officials, so it could be mailed without postage. However, someone needed to send an urgent letter and grabbed this form and put a stamp on the upper left corner covering the phrase Minister of Finances, wrote a short message, which I'll describe in a minute, and then sent it postpaid by the stamp through the mails. And then somehow, for some reason, the stamp had fallen off. So all we see is part of the cancel. So I thought, well, this is an interesting item. It was not very expensive. So I bought it. Right away, the fact that it was not very expensive was suspicious because I had read enough at that time and looked at several auction catalogs and never seen a form like this. So I knew if it was genuine, it would be rare. And why would I get it so cheaply from a dealer who obviously paid less for it from whoever owned it than I owned it? But OK, second question, why did that stamp fall off? This letter would not have been in water. Uh, there are some balloon mail letters that the stamp has floated off of because they were in a bag that was in water, like that one bag from the Ville d'Orléans that I talked about. But this just went over land. So there was no water. There's no evidence that it got soaked in the 150 years since it was allegedly sent. So this was rather suspicious. The postmark date is. Um, I believe um, October 6th, I don't remember, I looked at it closely. But anyway, the point is the date on this would mean that it would have been sent on the Armand Barbez, which is the balloon I talked about that carried um, Leon Gambetta. And that would make this desirable in and of itself since there wasn't much mail on that balloon. So that was suspicious. And mostly suspicious was the fact, as I said, I couldn't re read anything about it. Further, I already knew about items such as these, which had that same uh, picture in uh, you know, emblem on it. I knew that these items were essentially souvenirs created by a stamp dealer Arthur Mowry, most of them created after the war. There were a couple that he had made available during the war. Uh, they were blue in color. And there are a few legitimately used ones out there. And it really takes an expert to determine that. Any other color and most anything that you would find used on a, even on a blue form is a forgery. Nonetheless, I looked back on this form and said to myself, well, okay, so these other letter sheets were forgeries. Possibly he got the image, this diagram from this form, which was a genuine form. So, you know, every collector wants to believe he got a great deal, right? So I really wanted this to be a genuine, but I wasn't going to consider it genuine unless I had some way of verifying that. I showed this to some people, the reactions were, it's a nice item, but nobody knew really definitely whether it was a forgery or not. There is a listing in Evert and Tellier uh, in one of their recent catalogs that 
seems to describe this, but again, that's not uh, proof. Finally, someone suggested, why don't you ask Steve Walski, as I mentioned, and I emailed Steve. He was kind enough to respond quickly and said, uh, you ought to get your money back. That's a very skillful forgery you have. And as he explained, there were three ways that he knew it was a forgery. First of all, the post office that is indicated on the Parisian cancel there didn't exist until 1874. So it couldn't be an 1870 letter. Second of all, the cancel over on the left-hand side, the partial cancel, was not the form of cancel used by that post office when it did exist. And third of all, the October 9th date in Marseille is wrong. And had this letter been posted on that day in Paris, it would not have reached Marseille until October 11th. So it was a forgery. So I was saddened that I didn't have a real genuine rare balloon item, but I was pleased to have the facts and know what it was. I contacted the dealer who was very quick to give me my money back. So that came out okay. And it was only recently when I was doing a little more reading on the subject that I found some writing by Ernst Cohn in which he describes this for him and says, yeah, this is just a post-war souvenir, just like the other forms like this one. So that's my story. And so to answer the person about forgeries, as I mentioned, there are a lot out of there, out there, and they're not easy to determine unless you really know what you're doing or can get advice as I was fortunate enough to do from Steve. So that's about it. And I'll just wrap up very briefly a little bit about the end of the war and the after effects of the war. The armistice uh, was agreed upon on January 28th. The Parisians were suffering badly. Um, they had long run out of most food supplies. The Prussians had started bombarding the city. They didn't do that much in the beginning, but I guess they were getting impatient. And as you see in this picture that I found, uh, they were able to bombard Paris. So Jules Favre, whose job it was, signed an armistice with Bismarck, although it certainly wasn't uniformly agreed upon that France should uh, surrender at this point. There were people who wanted to continue to fight. Nonetheless, this is what happened. So balloon mail, a total of 67 balloons were flown out of Paris. A few of those were private balloons. Most of them were post office balloons. For one reason or another, not all of them carried mail. So 55 of them carried mail, 47 were successful in getting at least some of that mail into the French post, a pretty good uh, record. And as I mentioned, the estimate is about two and a half million letters, although how many of those survive, I don't know. But I do know that it's very easy to find an auction, especially in Europe, that has many balloon letters almost every auction of postal history has some. So there are a number out there, quite a few out there. Pigeons, as I mentioned, about 100,000 messages. Um, sounds like a small number compared to two and a half million, but it was a big deal for the Parisians to be able to get some messages into the city and find out how their relatives or friends or whatever were doing. Oh, sorry. So I have a couple of things I call the ironies and the agonies. Two ironies of the war. First of all, one of the things that France was trying to prevent was the unification of Prussia with all the other German states. Instead, the war that they declared catalyzed this because of the defense agreements um, that were with the remaining states that were not 
united with Prussia. This was something that was probably going to happen anyway. It's just probably happened a little sooner because of the joint defense effort. And to add insult to the injury of the unification of Germany, the formal ceremony was held in Versailles, which is where the king and then emperor and Bismarck were located at the time. So really sticking it to the French there. Um, the other thing that happened was after the armistice, there was an election in France for a new, new members of the National Assembly and a new government. This government and many of the members of the assembly were not very sympathetic to the Parisians and what they had gone through during the siege. And this combined with just being um, angry at losing the war and being angry at the French government for not doing a better job of fighting. And this being Paris, which knew something about revolutions, um, the Parisians set up their own government in Paris in, I believe, in March. And so for about two or two and a half months, there was literally a civil war between the commune in Paris, as it was called, and the French government. This was a very brutal war and would obviously make uh, a story in and of itself. But the irony is that after all that effort to get mail in and out of Paris during the siege, this was followed by the commune in which there was almost no mail or communication inside and outside of Paris. So talk about an irony. The agonies, uh, the Prussians demanded steep reparations. Uh, they kept the areas that they had occupied in Eastern France, Alsace and Lorraine, and they stayed under German control until the end of World War I. And so all this kind of remained in the French psyche, even if at the back of the mind. And when the turmoil started again in the 1910s, this was just another piece of fuel in the fire that led to World War I. But finally, a few silver linings, not necessarily result of the war, but what happened was France recovered quickly. They determined to, and actually did, uh, pay off the reparations quickly, which was Bismarck's condition for getting his troops out of France. So the troops did leave within a few years. And a very um, fruitful, period in France that we now call La Belle Epoque, started around 1880, which was a lot of uh, cultural innovation, economic success, things like the Universal Exposition of 1889, which saw the building of the Eiffel Tower, all those things happened. So France, essentially from 1880 until, I don't know, the early 1910s, was a very good period for France before they then descended into World War I. And lastly, the Third Republic, which started in 1870, did last through World War I and lasted until another irony, the German occupation in 1940. You know, you may remember the First Republic was declared during the French Revolution and it lasted only something like a half dozen years before Napoleon took over and declared himself emperor. Same thing sort of happened with the Second Republic, which was declared in 1848 after that revolution, but it was Louis Napoleon, Napoleon I's uh, nephew, who was elected president, not happy with being president, he managed to turn himself into emperor. That was the end of the Second Republic within a couple of years. So the Third Republic, not related to the war, but actually managed to last 70 years. So that was a benefit as well. Okay, I will end up by talking about a few of the reference works that are, that I, uh, that are worth mentioning and that are available. Um, the book on the left is called Besieged in Paris, 
written by Ashley Lawrence, who is a British historian and philatelist. Lawrence came across a family communication from the Brown family, which was an English family living and doing business in France, in Paris in 1870. So uh, Mrs. Brown and their two younger daughters went back to England before the war. Mr. Brown stayed in Paris to run the family business. And there was a lot of communication between the two spanning just about all the different methods of getting letters in and out of Paris. Ashley Lawrence managed to buy that correspondence at an auction and spent 10 years researching just about everything about the correspondence, the family, the war, and then put together this fantastic book. And it is available from him personally. He allows me to publish his email address. So I will send that out to everyone. The blue book, Balloon Post of the Siege of Paris, was published by the American Airmail Society in 1976. But it is still available in print today from the American Philatelic Society, cost about $10 or $11 um, plus postage, and is available to anyone. You don't have to be a member of the APS to purchase. And it contains parts of the reports of almost all of the balloons. So I mentioned that uh, most of the, uh, one of the passengers wrote a report either because it was the pilot who was a military man and that was his obligation or because it was someone who decided to write a book about it as Foucault did or someone who was asked by a newspaper because some reporter wanted to scoop, whatever. There are reports of just about all the flights, and they make fascinating reading. As you saw from the few examples I went in, some were very easy flights, some were rather treacherous, and um, so on. So there's a lot of good information there. Lastly is uh, Wonderful Balloon Ascents. This was a book originally written in French, uh, translated into English was written in, or published in January of 1870. So for a subject of balloons, it just missed one of the big events in ballooning history. However, it is a complete history of ballooning until then. So this is where I learned about the Montgolfier and Professor Charles that I talked about at the beginning and a lot of other information about ballooning from people who just thought about it before it was feasible up until 1870. The printed copy as a used book is not difficult to find, but a PDF copy of it is available free from Google Books and very worthwhile if you're at all interested in ballooning. So that's what I have. Thank you all for joining me this evening. And if there are any more questions, I will be glad to take them. Thank you, Larry. I haven't seen any come in through the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to ask one, I encourage you to do so. There have been several people complimenting your presentation, and that would include me as well. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And before, before you all give up, I will tell you that the last Tuesday of March, which should also be the 23rd, right? No, it'll be the 30th. I'm sorry. We will have a presentation on uh, Togo and Dahomey Postal Stationery. So tune in for that one as well. Now, does anybody have a question for Larry? Uh, Ken, Ed Grabowski here. Hi, Ed. Hi, I have a, just a comment uh, uh, that I think Larry might be interested in. By chance, my wife and I took our first vacation in France beginning in late August, 1970. Uh, until early October 1970 it was quite remarkable. I had only been working at Merck for five years and I disappeared for more than a month. And we were in Paris on September 4th, 1870. And they recreated at the city hall uh, uh, the uh, speaking of the Declaration of the Third Republic. And the whole government was there, including Pompidou as president uh, the actors from the Comédie Française 
read the Declaration of the Third Republic, the French mounted brass players on horses, this military unit, then came by somehow managing to blow these horns while riding horses. Uh, and then a, a cadre of planes flew over and dropped little parachutes with tree color, tree colors, French flags uh, on top of the on top of the little parachutes. And uh, so we, we helped celebrate the 100th anniversary of the declaration, Larry. I thought you may be interested in hearing that. <laughs> I am interested. I hadn't read about the celebration. That's really neat, of course. By then, France was on the Fifth Republic, but yeah, well, a lot of changes. As I mentioned, well, all the all all the republics are significant, but this one, um, so far, the Third Republic is the longest lasting. Uh, hopefully, the Fifth Republic will uh, beat that eventually when enough time passes. But indeed, that uh, so because it was so long lasting, it was really a very significant event. And I am pleased to hear the story. Thank you, Ed. Anybody else? Friends, I am so glad to have seen all your faces tonight. It's been wonderful. Larry, thank you again for a great presentation. And we'll see you all on the last Tuesday of March. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.